Ijama Wogu, welcome to Teaching in Higher Ed. Hi, it's such a pleasure to be here with you, Bonnie. I have been waiting for this conversation. I got to go to the replay of your book release party, and it has the best song on it. I played it the other night in the kitchen. I'm dancing around the kitchen. The song for people listening is called Joy Unspeakable by Voices of Fire. In case you can't tell from the name, it's all about joy. So how about we start with what brings you joy? Wow, what brings me joy? Oh man, lots of things bring me joy, but the thing that comes to mind is just seeing talent in people. I really love like observing people and seeing what they're good at, their strengths and how they are just awesome and specifically created to do that particular thing. I just came from Beyonce's concert last weekend and I'm like, man, this woman was designed to do exactly this because the stamina, the singing ability, all of it, I was just in awe at how we are all like specifically designed to do particular things in our lives. And we all have different strengths. So I, I'm just really big on that and observing people's talents. And that brings me a lot of joy. And isn't that great when you can just see it, you see I just, yeah, because I can't the- sing. I, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I cannot sing. So I appreciate a good singer. Um, a good every everything, you know, um, so I, I'm one that really appreciates talent. We have talked about so many different topics on this podcast. It's really been a delight just to think about all the places that we've gone. But with all the people that I have shared my excitement about talking to you today, every single person is like, oh, wait, you got to tell me, when is the book coming? When is, when is that episode going to air? What is it about what we, we often call imposter syndrome that resonates in such a visceral way with so many people? Absolutely, because it's something that most of us will encounter at some point in our lives, right? Um, depending on the situations we're in, oftentimes we enter new and challenging situations as life progresses. So once we enter those spaces, we start to wonder, are we enough? Are we capable of handling this? Are we deserving of this sort of role? And we start to question ourselves and that feeling is really uncomfortable. So that's something folks are really curious about figuring out how to get a good grip on and how to perhaps overcome it, surmount it, and move on with with the desires of their life. It's a common experience, it's a normal experience, but it's one that can make you feel like you're all alone in it. It, You could feel like you're the problem or no one else is dealing with this because you see them and they're smiling or they appear confident, but you don't really know what's going on in them, you know, in their minds and how a lot of people do grapple with this, even if they have a smile on their face, even if they appear confident. So it's an uncomfortable experience that people are looking to figure out how to mitigate. Some of what I'm hearing and what you shared, it, I'm getting a sense of self-reinforcing and not in a good way. So right. it, the circle of not good enough, not deserving, wait, other people have this figure out. Could you talk about somewhat of a cycle there or ways in which we may have this, this talk that we give to ourselves that's not going to be particularly helpful to release us from it? Sure. That self-reinforcement piece comes from past lived experiences and how we've internalized a lot of messages from media about who we are, our identities, and, you know, our upbringing, some cultural beliefs that shape who we are. And some of those cultural beliefs can be self-limiting, you know, ideas about maybe what a woman ought to do and how she should be and what a man is supposed to do or what you know, someone coming from this sort of family is supposed to be, right? And so many ideas we internalize, it becomes like part of our mindset. It's so embedded into our psyche that we just start functioning in those ways. And when we are in those new and challenging situations, we remember those messages that we've internalized and we continue that cycle over and over. So it does take a lot of intentionality and deliberate practice to sit down with yourself and say, why do I always shrink? when I am in this particular situation? Why do I have this horrible feeling within me that I can't do it, that I'm not enough? If we take time to sit down, reflect on our past and say, this is where it comes from. 
and do the work to dispel those ideas and to realize who you truly are, that you are capable, that you are worthy, we can then be very aware that these are false beliefs, these are the truths about myself, and I choose to move forward with the truths about who I am. So I think we have to be really deliberate about the mind work, just doing the personal work to get to where we want to be. One thing I know you want to caution us from, though, is the idea that it is all our fault and right. all of the blame lies on us. So would you speak now about the role that these oppressive environments play and, and build upon those scripts that you're describing around our sense of self-worth? Sure. You know, I remember I write about this in my book, chapter four, and I open it with the story from or the scene from Good Will Hunting. Do you remember that movie where, okay. you know, Sean, I think his name was Sean, <laughs> um, the, the young man, he had a breakthrough with his psychologist and his psychologist was telling him over and over, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. And he finally was able to embrace that, release his pain and move forward with like his life in a positive way. So the young man who was seeing the psychologist had a lot of negative feelings within him about like how he just navigated life. And a lot of the pain he had was from childhood abuse. So he internalized a lot. Perhaps he thought that the ab abuse was his fault and it took you know a supportive figure to help him move past that by reminding him that it is not his fault. And I remember when I was in graduate school, 22 years old, grad school, two years in that program in those three hour long classes and thinking that, you know, I was an imposter in that space and thinking that I was the problem without recognizing how my environment played a huge role in the way I navigated that space. We end up thinking that we are the problem, we need to fix it without factoring in the role of perhaps your oppressive past or the environment that you're currently in. And one word that I use in the book is called imposterize. When you are in a space and others are imposterizing you or trying to make you feel inferior or gaslighting you, and you may very well come into that space feeling confident, but then when people are imposterizing you and making you feel like they're not supposed to be there, then you start to question yourself then you start to wonder, oh my gosh, do I belong here? So those external forces do play a significant role. And I want folks to be mindful of your past history and how, you know, a lot of impositions that happened to you, a lot of things that were imposed upon you um, were not your fault and they shaped your mindset, but it's up to us to do, to do the work of dismantling those false beliefs and to also recognize like in the workplace or in any other space that you're in that may not be healthy, and that is not empowering to you, but instead it's oppressive, we have to be mindful of that as well. Because knowing that it's not your fault, there is a liberating factor to that, to know that there's nothing wrong with you, that you are supposed to be there with your unique qualities and everything that you bring and holding on to that versus the negative messages that you're getting. As you're talking, it fills me with hope. And, and yet it can be so so difficult to break out of those cycles and those scripts. Yeah. How does community then play a role in helping us be able to identify and, and begin to break down and, and create new scripts that are more helpful to us? For sure. It's, it's, it's so valuable to be around diverse folks, folks who are different from you, but it's so important to also be in spaces with like-minded folks, folks who look like you, folks who have similar beliefs, because that can be reinforcing of who you are and to let you know that you are enough. Like when you are in a community, you can feel belonging. And as social beings, we definitely desire belonging. And being in a community helps with that, to remind you that you belong, to remind you that you are accepted just as you are, to have people to encourage you, support you, um, and provide you with resources that you probably wouldn't have if you were kind of isolated and trying to figure things out on your own. So when you know that people are supportive of you, it's empowering and it makes you want to pursue your life goals even more. We've had in the show in the past, Peter Felton and his researcher, Heidi Weston. Yeah. And one of the things they contrasted in that episode a, a time or two ago, they were talking about that oftentimes in higher education and in other educational contexts, we use the word belonging. Yeah. But what that really translates to is assimilation. Mm. And 
love the way that you've described it here. Belonging in this sense and this example you gave us isn't with people that are different than you, that, that you then have that pressure to to adopt to their cultural or their gender. Right. And instead, the, by the way, their research uh, focuses then instead on mattering, that yes. maybe we, maybe hmm. we can could challenge the what we try to do with that word or that idea of belonging mm. and in those more diverse groups that you were describing then maybe mattering could be what we focus on that people's people matter as opposed to belong but but yeah this absolutely is, I love that it can be one of those things that can just be relaxing in a way in a healthy because when then you can just let it all go, we don't have to pretend that these things don't exist. And someone's really going to understand when you describe something that happened, you talked about gaslighting. And that's certainly a word that boy, oh boy, just sounds really, really familiar to me in, in <laughs> context that I'm in. But then somebody who can understand go, oh, well, that's exactly what's going on. And, and just, you need those spaces, sure. because our mind can play tricks on us, right? They can play Absolutely. tricks where mm -hmm. we start to back to those old scripts. So mm. what's a way that community has really been helpful to you in, in identifying some of the things for yourself in certain contexts where you struggled with some of this, or, or has that been a, a struggle yeah. for you ever? Oh, for sure. As an entrepreneur, I'm many things. And one of the hats I have <laughs> is to be an entrepreneur. So lots of imposter syndrome when it comes to stepping outside of your comfort zone to um, establish certain programs or projects for your business. So I am part of a mastermind, a group full of entrepreneurial women who are striving to have thriving businesses. So in that space, we help each other a lot with mindset, with reminding each other of who we are and what we're capable of, and to help dispel some of those self-limiting beliefs that we try to carry with us and think that we're operating in a quote unquote realistic manner when we're actually just playing small. That's all that is. So we need those constant reminders from like-minded folks. So you were just saying, yes, people can help remind us of who we are and what we're capable of. Absolutely. Because sometimes, of course, you've, you've heard the cliche saying we are our worst critics. We're the ones dealing with the internalized thoughts, but other people are not having those thoughts about my, you know, yourself in those moments. So they're able to move the cloud of doubt and tell you the reality of the situation, right? So we have our coach and we coach each other and being in that space has really helped me move past those doubts and fears that I have to do what it takes to have a thriving business. And I consider myself a very confident person. Um, I know who I am. I believe, at least I think I know who I am. <laughs> but it's so interesting how imposter anxiety will still kind of creep up and show up in spaces and it'll give you this logic like, are you sure you want to do that? Well, how about the money piece? Or how about this piece? Or will people like it? And it sounds logical, but then it's really, um, it comes from fear. It comes from a lot of fear. So um, being able to identify that and choosing to do the opposite of what that fear is saying is a strategy that's critical in moving past imposter anxiety. You talked about the money piece, and that's exactly where my mind was going. People yeah. close to me that have been parts of groups like you're describing, it comes up so much with people, whether it's if you started to do some speaking in a higher education context, but not at an academic conference, but one where oh. you might be paid all yeah. the different amounts where people might get paid. And I've loved on social media before where people have been really, really transparent about that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can go, I mean, sometimes these figures might feel outrageous to you if you don't, right. if you have that sense of, I don't really have much to offer here, but then to get that sense of community, what is the market paying for this sort of thing? Exactly. <laughs> but exactly. by the way, the market will also be happy to pay you nothing. And, uh -huh. and, that, and then, but to have those conversations that can be self-reinforcing. And I also have found it helpful, whether it's job negotiations, uh -huh. Uh -huh. money for speaking, or if you do have a, a, business, some of our colleagues might do some sort of consulting or that kind of thing to have someone who's not you yes. challenge you on how yes. much you thought, because yes. it, it's also weird when it's you, mm -hmm. if you're selling a product that is, you know, something tangible, that's not you, <laughs> that is one thing, but what you, what you're selling feels like very, very attached to you and your sense of worth and your identity. Those can be such challenging, challenging, challenging things. You use the phrase playing small. Tell me more about playing small and what that looks like. Yeah. Playing small is, is about, like I said before, 
thinking that you're being realistic and logical when really it's just limiting yourself. You have the potential, you have the capacity to do bigger things. You even know what to do, but you try to play it safe to um, reduce the risk involved, to just like not have things go the wrong way because of the fear of failure. And uh, we could go on and on like fear, the fear of failure. I talk about that in the book as well. And I encourage readers to really embrace failure. Failure to me is success because failure is intel, intel to use for your next endeavor so that you know exactly what to do and you improve along the way. So for me, failure, I celebrate my failure because it's a stepping stone in the right direction. It's not a stumbling block. So in me, like kind of <laughs> talking about fear of failure, I want to go back to your original question. Can you please remind Remind oh, okay. Well, I was all getting into your fear of failure. I was so ready. <laughs> yeah. Is that ultimately we were talking about uh oh playing small, playing yes, small. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, all these things we think we're protecting ourselves, right? Putting on this armor that ultimately that fear of failure and what it what it limits. And that's what that's what you were talking about. This oh yes. Is- so that's exactly it. it. It's driven by the fear of failure. You don't want to fail, you don't want to embar- embarrass yourself. Um, So you try to do what you know you're capable of doing, but then you don't tap into what you're also capable of doing, that you're capable of doing more, right? Um, So I think that's a huge element of it. Some of what you're, you've really been talking about this entire time is the idea that you share about of self-kindness, another part of of this that we can do? What are some examples that you've observed in your work of us when we're really not being kind to ourselves? Yeah. And again, it's not our fault because I think of perfectionism. We have a culture where we embrace perfectionism when we really shouldn't. I mean, we should aim for excellence in what we do. And knowing that doing enough is 100%. Being good at something is 100%. Being great is good. Being excellent is, is, is awesome. You could strive for that. But knowing when to say, okay, I cannot burn myself out. What I have is sufficient. Sufficiency is 100%. And rest assured in that and finding solace in knowing that you have done enough. Because in this life, we are so responsible for so many things. And we have to use our energy for so many other things. So know that you've produced something excellent. Be okay with that and you know move forward with what else you have to do but with perfectionism people tend to just keep going even after something is excellent but with that fear they're they're driven by a fear of will they like this is this good enough i gotta do more and staying up too late at night and worrying themselves trying to perfect something that is already excellent so I'm, a, you know, a huge advocate of self-care and not burning oneself out because I know what burnout feels like and it's really hard to come out of that. And when you're dealing with imposter anxiety, you can drive yourself to burn yourself out because you're trying to live up to perfectionistic expectations. So we have to be very mindful of that. I'm on the, the team that I work the most closely with. We, we have to constantly be using this phrase. We sort of introduce the language of good enough. I'm, I'm yeah. figuring out, I'm discerning on this, what is good enough. Cause we, you talked about at the beginning of our conversation about how much joy it brings you when you yeah. see other people that are doing their thing with all of the goodness of why they were created yes. in the first place to do those amazing things that can be addicting and really, really healthy ways. And yet, mm-hmm. as you say, we cannot bring that excellence to every aspect of our lives all of the time. We're being pulled mm-hmm. at in all these different directions. So I th- think introducing that for people, because I do get very, very energized by excellence. Yeah. And I work with people who, I mean, that is just one of the most best feelings that you can have. And yet we want to, we want to be wise and discerning about where that gets put out into the world. Cause it, it can't get out into the world. And especially I think some context where you like to, it's enjoyable too to go, but we could do this. How about this? How, Oh, we could try this. And that that's a right. good, good thing. You can create excellence. And then at some point you go good enough. Yes. And prioritizing, I mean, it might be able to get to be done down the line, but prioritizing what is important in that moment, right? Versus like the emotional urgency you're feeling at that moment. Um, But just to reiterate what we've talked about, I'm all about striving for excellence. 
um, but I am not about perfectionism, right? So that's what we have to really distinguish the difference between the two. Yeah, excellence, you know, and I, I remember an instance when, um, get a little spiritual here. <laughs> Uh, I was reading the Bible, um, a study Bible that kind of interprets certain words for you. And I remember when, I'm so bad with knowing Bible, by the way, it's it's horrible. So I think in Genesis, like it was talking about um, how God created something and it was good. And it kept saying that word good. And in the bottom, it would interpret good as meaning complete, like full, complete. And complete means 100%. So when people feel like good is not enough, it is enough. You're done, you're finished, it's everything, it's excellent, right? It's okay to do a little bit more, but be careful not to operate with fear while doing that. That's the key. So just wanted to throw that, that in a little bit. What a beautiful translation of that complete. I'm gonna bring that back to my, to my group and have yeah. us talk about that word complete. Yeah, yeah. How, what are some other ways you try to distinguish for yourself and for others that you work with as far as what, how do I know if this is perfectionism and mm -hmm. how this is that great pursuit of excellence? What are some questions yeah. we might ask ourselves? Or... I, I mean, one of the questions I would ask myself is, have I spent too much time doing this? And to really be honest with myself, have I spent too much time doing this? Do I feel like these feelings inside that feel heavy, feel uncomfortable? Do I feel even a little nauseousness? Like, what do you feel? Pay attention to how you feel inside because those feelings will tell you what's really going on. You have to ask yourself, am I operating in fear? Like, am I being guided by fearful thoughts of being exposed as a fraud? If that's the case, then we have to take a pause and remember like what we're doing, who we are, all those things, like just take a pause and remember what it means to be good enough. You know, that good is complete. And you don't have to like worry about insignificant details of something you're working on when no one else is gonna even notice it. You have to ask yourself, will people even notice this thing? Or like, is it that serious? And one thing I really talk about a lot is relying more on your presence versus your performance. To me, presence is far more important than someone's performance. Because presence to me, when someone is present in a moment, they are curious and they are actively listening. They are showing interest. They are participating. And to me, that's someone who has a growth mindset. And you don't have to carry with you the expectations of trying to do something perfectly and all that. You're just coming as you are, being a sponge and absorbing the information that's coming at you and taking in your surroundings and being an active participant. So I want people to depend more on their presence because that's more powerful a lot of times than you showing up in front of a group and saying all the right words and having the right poise and, you know, clicking the button at the right time. Like all of that is cute and all that, but allow yourself to be more authentic in the space by leveraging your presence. I think that can go a long way. I remember hiring a staff of people and uh, they were in a leadership class and they were all trying to impress me by using these cool words and raising their hands often so that I would hire them. But there was one student in particular who didn't say anything in class, but I can tell that she was super curious and looking around and taking notes and nodding when her classmates would speak. And just her presence was what made her stand out to me. And that was the first person I hired because of her presence, told me that she's someone who is curious, willing to learn, someone who would be appreciative of their team, all of that. Those were the messages I was getting just from her disposition. So it's really important to know when to tap into your presence. So when you're feeling all of that doubt and you have the pressure, you feel the pressure to perform, say, hey, okay. I have power through my presence. Let me embrace that and just allow myself to be in a space because that is more than enough. That's actually what will allow people to feel curious about you or feel comfortable around you is your presence. So let's leverage it. One of our kids was practicing a presentation that they're giving today at school. And I wish I would have had these words last night because I was seeing that. I mean, they're not that old. And those messages start to get in pretty early about mm. the performance versus the presence. Yeah. 
they were getting prepared to tell stories about their grandparents and World War II and some really powerful experiences and scary things about the Holocaust. And I mean, like this family history that is is very, very near and dear to this this child's life. Mm-hmm. Yet they're making sure they hit every bullet point. <laughs> going, mm. It's not the bullet points, you know, these stories. And you know, and- just with you talking about that, I'm sorry to interject. Oh, with yeah. you talking about, it makes me so curious to know like the personal connection they have, the emotional connection they have, at, you know, about the story versus just having all the points together. As you're talking, that's what's making me curious. I want to know how they personally feel about all of that and they can achieve that through their presence. You know, okay. that's just, that's just what I'm thinking about. But, but as tension, you were saying. Yeah, those tension and the nerves, they come, they come so early. Yes. But what wisdom you're sharing with us, the the presence. Mm-hmm. And that, I mean, you can tell when someone's all about the performance, it shows. It shows, absolutely. Vulnerability and a lack of authenticity and people, yeah. that, they know that. I'm curious to know if you have experienced someone like who comes to mind for you what situation were you in when you witnessed someone who was really in their presence and that was noticeable do you remember anything like that any situation where you've observed that well it's very much what you're saying where the quietest person in the room Mm. when the quietest person in the room they typically will ask a question and it's a question that changes the entire conversation wow yeah able to focus more on what is being said yes. and discerning that without feeling like it needs to become a performance. And that's where I see it the most, where I go, it's when someone asks a question, and especially if that question came out of long periods of silence and listening, a lot of times we can get in the habit of, oh, I've got my thing I want to say, but that person just said their thing and that person said their thing and that person said their thing and trying to fit our thoughts and ideas, not that they're not valid. Right. So this too, by the way, in case anyone's wondering, I had yeah. something I wanted to say, and you know, you're a very energized group. It is fun to be around that, but you ask the question, where do I feel that the most? And it's in a room like that, where our thoughts are a little bit jumbled. Yeah. We're, 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 we are energized, not we're bad people or whatever. But then when that one person who's not said anything the whole time and they ask a question, we all go, Exactly. Oh, okay. (laughs) And look at that strength. We're seeing someone who's able to sit and observe and listen. And there is such value in that. And one thing, like I think about with you talking, I think about introvert people who are more on the introverted side of the spectrum. And then folks who are, who feel that they are more extroverted and how our society rewards extroversion, like class participation, speak up, you know, we reward that. So a lot of folks who identify as introverts may feel like they're not enough, right? When they actually have a strength within them, which is listening and being able to ask those powerful questions because of their listening power, right? So imposter anxiety gets us all. (laughs) And definitely we'll have folks who identify as introverts as feeling like, am I even contributing in valuable ways as other people are? My final question before we get to the recommendations is a hard one, just because you've talked so much about how hard we can be on ourselves. Yeah. Scripts that we've got going and the self-reinforcing and when maybe when we haven't found that community yet, I'm still going to ask it anyway, though. It's not bubble baths. It's not cute journals, although those things are lovely uh, that are going (laughs) to really make the mark. What's a small step that we could take that actually might be a fulcrum to greater change? Sure. I would say like the moment you are feeling that self-doubt or that fear of failure, treat it as a sign of success because that indicates that you are about to embark on something new, something challenging, that you may be in a space where you're preparing to stretch yourself and that leads to growth. So those feelings let you know that you're about to step out of your comfort zone. So lean into that. It is a sign of success. Well, now you're making me want to ask one more question. (laughs) All good. Let's do it. How much do you think it's helpful to share those feelings with others? And at what point does it become not a helpful thing? How do you discern between it might be helpful just to mention that that it's feeling particularly challenging? Or are there ways that that then invites the people 
or persons we're sharing with to maybe continue the patterns, even if they don't recognize that they're doing it. So I'm feeling imposter syndrome, yeah. you know, and I'm feeling stretched. I'm preparing yeah. I'm with another person or persons. Yeah. When do we say, Oh, I'm really feeling. <laughs> and when yeah. do we go, when- we're going to push through, we're going to push through and we're just going to oh. keep that to ourselves. Is there a way that you sort of discern that? For all about revealing it to heal it. That's my saying, like reveal it to heal it, but it's important to reveal it to the right person. <laughs> reveal it to someone you trust, someone who makes you feel emotionally safe. And that's like a trusted colleague, trusted friend. It's okay to tell them. I mean, not every moment will allow you to pick up the phone and be like, hey, I'm feeling like this, or to knock on someone's door and be like, hey, this is how I feel. Not every situation will allow for that. But if you feel like you're constantly dealing with this It may be that you're constantly dealing with it. It may be that you're not constantly dealing with it. But if you find that you're in a space and it allows for you to reach out to someone to say, hey, this is how I'm feeling, please reveal it to heal it. That helps to heal because that person may have a word or two for you to really encourage you and help you move that negative cloud and see the reality of the moment, right? So it's always helpful to get that piece of support. What you just said, reveal it to heal it. I heard you describe out of the context. So if I'm getting up to give the big presentation, if I'm in front of the board, if I am in a high stakes situation, I'm hearing you say probably not. I mean, you didn't say it, but do we need to always tell other people how we're feeling or could we have that safe person, that safe space? And in those moments, we're going to they could tell we make it. I mean, you know what? <laughs> that is a good question. I would love to have more dialogue on what people think about that. Yeah. Um, I think if you feel compelled to do that, there is power. Uh, there is power in vulnerability. I know mm-hmm. Brene Brown speaks a lot about um, the power of vulnerability and to speak and say, "Yeah, I don't know if you all feel the way I feel, but the nerves are real." Like to add like a comedic element to it, like in front of people because you might normalize that experience for other people who also have to get up and say something to to let them know that they're not alone. So through your vulnerability, you can add power to the situation and how you feel and how others feel and keep it moving. So that's, that's a possibility, but sometimes you might be in a space where people aren't that welcoming of your authentic self or don't want to hear how you feel or whatever. And so you might want to be wary of those sort of situations because folks can use it against you somehow. And I know, do you know Jodi Ann Bury? I think that's her, her, how to pronounce her last name. She ta- oh. she has a book coming out in maybe a, a year or two called Authentic. And One of her arguments is that the workplace will say, be your authentic self, come just as you are. But if that space is not welcoming, like of who you really are, can you really be authentic in that space? So she really um, asked that question and has us thinking through that (laughs) as a factor, right? It's, It's all good to be authentic, but you have to do it in the right space that will nurture that authenticity, that will appreciate that authenticity. And not every space is like that. Um, what I loved about your example that you gave, if I were watching you, I would feel like just because it, it was quick, it was funny, it was authentic. But then, like you said, you use the phrase, we're moving on then to there's a reason why you came, why I'm listening to you present, you know what I mean? So it's not belaboring it. But what, yeah. what I heard you and your example give was an opportunity for people to find you so relatable. Mm-hmm. And, we do that when we do it well I think you just invite people to really love who you really are and love who they are too because it's like oh my gosh I can so relate to that now I'm imagining what it would be like if I've ever done something like she's doing right now and I'm watching her do so it's really what a great example that you gave and now that I didn't think about it when you asked but as you were speaking I remembered in my doctoral program all of us were there we were just uptight and ready to just speak eloquently because we thought we were supposed to speak like that and one of the one of our outspoken classmates was like look i know we all feel like imposters right now so we could just stop pretending and everyone just started laughing and i remember at that moment we all just uh we let our guards down and we just were we just allowed ourselves to be authentic and trusting of each other. And I I just remember that moment, like, wow, he really called it out and released all of us from, you know, this tight grip of, of uh, imposter anxiety in that space. Yeah. I sometimes admit at the start of a class these days that I'm, 
term or a semester, you know, I'm feeling nervous. I always feel nervous when I, cause I want to do a great job. I really oh. care about you. We, we just met each other, but I take this really seriously. And then so many times they feel nervous too, just like the example. Yeah. So you, you feel you're a professor. Yeah. Yes. And you feel nervous even at the beginning of a new class. Yeah. And I feel like nerves can really help us do really well. They can help us with the excellence that you've been talking about this whole no, time. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I agree with that. If you feel that sense of, hey, that sense of whatever people call it, is it a calling? Is it joy? Is, what, what is it? Then you're ready for it. You're, you've absolutely. prepared and you're ready for it. But there is that go, okay, I have prepared. Yeah. It's scary because these people are new, but yeah. 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 I think we that's, all want that. We all I want to be doing something that we were yeah. put on this planet to do and and mm-hmm. find out what that is and do more Absolutely. of it and be challenged you talked about earlier about the failing if we're actually mm-hmm. allowing ourselves to fail what that looks like in our lives yeah I all right that. well we better switch over to our recommendation segment because i know you've got something to recommend and i don't want to <laughs> miss it so i have two things i want to recommend and they are both songs i mentioned the first one when we first started recording and that is the song that was played on the start of your book release party and it's called joy unspeakable by voices of fire and it's featuring pharrell williams oh my goodness that that (laughs) dancing it is amazing i love it i did ask for permission that i could share that because i didn't know if that's what you recommend oh absolutely of course and then the second song is kind of the opposite of that and then totally not the opposite of that. There's a band I've recommended a song of theirs before and they're, they do such a nice job with their lyrics. So the band is called Lawrence. Uh-huh. And the song is called I'm Confident That I'm Insecure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Line, it just keeps going over and over and over. I'm confident that I'm insecure Clever. and i warn listeners this band lawrence the w- one i recommended previously there is some colorful language so if mm-hmm. you've got people around that are not going to appreciate a little bit of risque lyrics mm-hmm. there's a case it's not throughout <laughs> the entire song but there's a couple of, of words that you may not you know wish your five-year-old to hear yes. but it is such a hoot it's so playful what they do with the lyrics and for their songs, I tend to like the acoustic versions mm-hmm. even more than I like the ones that are really all polished for the studio. So I'm going to recommend today the, acu- they call it the acoustic-ish the <laughs> ish version, which I will link to of I'm confident that I'm insecure. Yes. And I get to pass it over to you now for whatever you would like to recommend each sure. other. Listen, I love that. I, that's the first thing I'm going to do when we get off is go listen to this song. <laughs> So I don't have a song to recommend, but I do have a person and she has a book. The book is called Ask For More. Her name is Alexandra Carter. She is an outstanding speaker. She is a professor at, I believe, Columbia University. um, And she talks about negotiating and she really provides a lot of mind shift insights that make so much sense, just mind blowing in how she teaches us how to negotiate in everything that you're doing, especially salary increases, any deals you have going on, negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. And I agree with her because I I think we oftentimes, again, play small or think that we're not worth the amount that can be offered. And I find that um, after learning that it's important to negotiate, I started doing that in all of my dealings, right? And I would always get more because I asked for more. So encouraging everyone not to settle. There's more out there for you if you only ask. So if you're not into reading, follow her on Instagram. She is outstanding. That's who I would recommend. And I would also recommend a TV series, Ted Lasso. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Ted Lasso is an outstanding series. And there are a couple of scenes where they talk about power posing and how you do things with your body to expand your body, make your eyes wide, open your mouth, even stick out your tongue, spread your arms out, like just take up as much space as you can because that can help you present in a more confident way. 
Like your body tells your mind what to do. Like you're expanding yourself, you're big. So go out there and be big, right? So I love those illustrations that they show us on that TV series. Sorry if I'm spoiling it for anyone, I apologize, but just wanted to tell you the reason why I I appreciate that show because it really illustrates what taking up space looks like. I'm totally remembering, I'm having flashbacks to the scenes that you're talking about, or at least Mm. I can remember. Do you remember the scene about getting curious and they're playing darts and what happens when we're not curious. I'm not going to give it away for listeners in case they haven't seen that one. I'm going to send it to you because it is one of those that I just watch over and over again. It's what happens when we don't get curious and I'll put it in the show notes. Don't you watch watch that. You watch the the series over and over or that scene over and over. Oh, the scene over and over again. And it's on YouTube. Oh no, I'm sending it to you. Oh yes, please. I love that dart scene, by the way, but I don't remember the part about curiosity. So I'd like to see. Yeah, it's, it's essentially, um, he has intentionally tied one of his hands behind his back without the other person knowing because the other person didn't ask enough questions and didn't get curious enough about his life. So then when he reveals that he has been intentionally weakening his, um, showmanship as a dartsman, then it's, it's so fun to see. Mm-hmm. I love it. The messages in that show are just outstanding. Oh, cool. you're going to the, the writers. <laughs> and I'll be sending you the clip so you can do the song mm-hmm. and then you can do the clip and we can all go back and revisit the uh, Ted, Ted Lasso scenes too. I'll put a few in the show notes. So if I can find the power pose, I bet I probably can find the power yeah. pose. Yeah for people to watch. Yeah. And revisit. So what an absolute joy it has been to get so to know fun. you following you on Instagram. You are absolutely need to be following. <laughs> you are, I saw, I don't remember how I came across your account. I, I, I think, think was, I, t- I messaged you because of someone we know, a mutual person. Oh, no, I remember messaging you first and being oh, home. Oh, oh, I thought I messaged you. <laughs> hey, you possibly ever come on and you're like, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good you and have- your husband do outstanding podcasts. So I'm so happy to be here with you. Well, I've been happy to have you and I'm um, so looking forward to people getting the book in their hands and to people being able to listen to the episode. Thank you so much for today. Thank you so much, Bonnie.